Imagine I complete a complex computation, such as solving an equation, executing an algorithm, or proving a mathematical theorem, and I want to convince you that I have achieved a valid result. I could show you, and you could check that my answer is indeed a valid result of my calculation, but what if I want to prove my valid result without telling you the answer, or even sharing anything that could assist you in reproducing the result yourself? Is there a way for me to convince you that I have a solution while revealing no information about what it is? At first glance, this seems like an impossible task. That's what I believed when I first encountered the idea of zero knowledge proofs, or ZKP for short. But if that were true, you would not be watching this video. So you're probably already suspecting that the answer is not no, but a fascinating yes. A zero-knowledge proof is a protocol that allows one party, known as the prover, to prove to another party, known as the verifier, that they know a certain piece of information without revealing anything about the content of that information. The potential of zero-knowledge proofs is astounding, for many applications, as ZKP can be used to prove statements about private data without revealing information about that data. For example, imagine that you want to prove to someone that you're a citizen of a country without giving them your name or passport number. With a ZKP-based identity solution, you could prove that you're a citizen without revealing your identity. Another use case for ZKP is to prove that I have enough money for some transaction, or that I don't have a particular medical condition without revealing anything else about my finances or medical situation. So how do zero-knowledge proofs work? Let's start with an example. Consider two friends, Peggy and Victor, who like solving Sudoku puzzles. Sudoku is a type of a numerical puzzle that was made popular in the first decade of the 21st century. It consists of a 9x9 grid, which the solvers must fill with the digits from 1 to 9, so that each row, column, and 3x3 block contain each digit exactly once. The grid starts with a few digits already in place, so there is usually a single solution. In our example, Peggy has solved the Sudoku puzzle and wants to prove her success to Victor, without spoiling anything about the solution to him, because Victor still intends to solve the Sudoku himself. But Peggy has a problem. Revealing the location of even a single digit beyond the starting digits will provide Victor information that will spoil his fun. So how can Peggy do it? You can pause the video now if you want to think about it. Okay. The proof method that Peggy and Victor use goes like this. First, they take 27 sets of 9 cards with the 1 to 9 digits on them. The cards are one-sided, so that when they are set face down, it's impossible to know their digits. Peggy and Victor make 81 piles, each composed of 3 cards with the same digit. This part is called the setup phase, and Peggy and Victor do it together so that they are both sure everything happens honestly. The next phase is called the proving phase. Peggy sets the piles of cards face down in a 9x9 grid, constructing her solution to the Sudoku. The initial digits are then flipped face up, so that it is clear this is a proof to the puzzle in question and not some other Sudoku. Last is the verification phase. Victor takes the top card from each pile and sets them together next to the corresponding row. Next, he takes the middle card from each pile and sets them together next to the corresponding column. Finally, he takes the remaining card from each pile and sets them together in the corresponding 3x3 block. Victor now has 27 piles of 9 cards. He shuffles each of those piles separately and then flips them face up and checks that they each contain each digit exactly once. If this checks out, Victor can conclude that Peggy indeed has a valid solution to the Sudoku puzzle in question. Note that due to his card shuffling, Victor has gained no knowledge about the location of any of the digits from Peggy's solution. All he has learned is that this solution obeys the rules of Sudoku. Something interesting to note here is that the amount of work expended by Victor is similar to that of checking a valid solution rather than finding the solution himself. I hope by now you are convinced that zero-knowledge proofs are in fact real and can be constructed to solve various problems related to privacy and security. Of course, our Sudoku example was very specific, and as a result, it may not be immediately easy to see how ZKPs can be generalized to other problems. Furthermore, we will not be deep diving into the granular details of ZKP systems. There are quite a number of different systems, all of which use heavy mathematical machinery to make them work. Instead, we will direct our focus onto one of the strongest branches in the ZKP toolbox and describe the general structure of a family of ZK proofs called SNARKs. SNARK is an abbreviation for Succinct Non-Interactive Argument of Knowledge. Let's break that abbreviation down. 
Succinctness refers to the property of a proof being small in size and quick to verify, regardless of the size of the input data. In the Sudoku problem, we have seen that the effort of verifying Peggy's solution was smaller than the effort to find it, but it wasn't small enough to qualify as succinct. The reason is that this effort would grow if we increase the size of the problem. Say, if we introduce the proof to a 16 by 16 Sudoku puzzle. In a succinct proof, this effort would stay a constant, or approximately constant, as we increase the problem size. This is particularly useful in situations where the problem or solution is very large, but the verifier needs to be able to quickly check the proof. Non-interactive means that there is no back and forth between Peggy, the prover, and Victor, the verifier, in order for Victor to be convinced of the proof. Essentially, this means that once Peggy has laid out the proof, she is no longer needed and Victor can check the proof completely on his own. Recall the three phases of the Sudoku proof, setup, proving, and verification. Even though the setup phase is performed by both Peggy and Victor, it is not considered an interaction for our purpose, because it is independent of the specific Sudoku Peggy wanted to prove. In fact, Peggy and Victor could have prepared the piles of cards in advance for even many more such proofs in the future, and then for every specific puzzle they wanted to prove, they would only need to perform the proving and verification phase without any back and forth. The argument terminology means that we relax a bit what we mean by proving something. In a mathematical context, when you prove a claim, say 1 plus 1 equals 2, you generate a list of logical steps and constructions based on a set of axioms that can be checked rigorously so that if both parties agree on the axioms, a valid proof will always be accepted and a false one always rejected. When talking about an argument, we take a statement and generate a block of data based on previously generated data from the setup phase. Contrary to proofs, however, we actually allow for a small probability of accepting a false argument as true. This probability is referred to as the soundness of the argument, and we want to make it extremely small. In fact, we mean making it small enough that it would take a cheating prover an astronomical amount of time to construct a false proof that would be accepted. For example, a typical snark will have a soundness of 2 to the power of minus 128. That means it would take on average 2 to the power of 128, or about 340 trillion 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 attempts to construct a possible fake argument. So given a trillion computers, each constructing a trillion fake arguments each second, it would still take more than 10 million years to construct a passing fake argument. And finally, the last part of SNARK stands for of knowledge, which means that the statement Peggy is proving is not just about the existence of a solution to a problem, but of her knowledge to the solution. So how can we build a SNARK? In general, a SNARK is built of five building blocks, arithmetization, commitment scheme, cryptographic scheme, interactive oracle proof, Fiat-Chamir transformation. Let's discuss what each of them does. The first building block, arithmetization, is a method for taking the statement that is to be proved and phrasing it in the form of a list or a table of numbers. For example, the solved Sudoku puzzle is already arithmetized, but there are arithmetization schemes that are more generic and allow for proving any statement. An example of such a scheme would be to monitor all of the variables of a certain computer program and output their value at every clock cycle in the program runtime. Another example of arithmetization is to formulate the calculation using an arithmetic circuit, a graph where each node has input and output wires, and the output wire is set to some arithmetic operation of the input ones. The arithmetization scheme, then, is a record of the value on each wire. Now that our statement is arithmetized, the next step is for Peggy to commit to it with a commitment scheme. A commitment is a way for Peggy to make certain information about the statement public in such a way that she cannot later change the statement in any way. In the Sudoku example, this is the part where Peggy lays down the cards facing down. At this point, the solution to the Sudoku is either hidden in those cards or not, and Peggy cannot change this fact later. For a commitment scheme to be useful for zero knowledge, it needs to be both binding and hiding. Binding means it does not allow for any later changes, and hiding means that it does not reveal any information. The hiding property in the Sudoku example was obtained by the cards facing down. 
This works in a physical setting, but we also need a way to do so in a digital setting. This is achieved using cryptography, meaning the values of the arithmetized statement are encrypted. Generally, asymmetric cryptography is used, so that anyone can encrypt information, but not to decrypt it. So, a commitment is made of encrypted information that Victor cannot decrypt, but that he can verify that it matches some non-encrypted information sent by Peggy. Once Peggy has committed to the statement, the next step is for Victor to establish that it obeys the rules of the problem for which it is meant to be a solution. In our Sudoku example, this is the part where Victor takes the card for each row, column and block, shuffles them and then flips them face up to see they indeed obey the rules of Sudoku. This is of course very specific for the Sudoku problem in a physical setting. The digital way this is done is known as an interactive oracle proof. It allows for interaction between Peggy and Victor and for Victor to have what we call oracle access to the solution. Put simply, this is a protocol of question and answer, wherein Victor can ask Peggy different questions about the solution and Peggy answers each of them until Victor is satisfied that the solution obeys the rules of the problem. The oracle here means that there is something that ensures Victor gets honest answers about the solution. In Snarks, the oracle is given by the fact that Victor can check if the answers he gets match the commitment that Peggy made. The binding property of the commitment needs to ensure to a very high probability that if Peggy is dishonest she will fail to match the commitment. Note that the Sudoku is not a good example of an interactive oracle proof since it is not interactive. Once Peggy has made a commitment, Victor can test the solution without her. A way in which we could make the Sudoku solution more similar to usage of an IOP is if instead of checking all the rows, columns and blocks, Victor chose any of those at random and asked Peggy about them. Say he first chose the 7th row, then the top right block, then the 4th column, etc. Every time he would get the matching pile of cards, shuffle them and check that they indeed obey the rules. Now, let's consider the case that Peggy lied about having a solution. Say she managed only to get an invalid solution with two pairs of swap digits which disturb two columns and no rows or blocks. For every check that Victor does, he has 2 in 27 probability to detect this problem. If he checks every row, column and block except two, and they are all correct, there is still a 2 divided by 26 times 27 or around 0.3% probability that the two he did not check are the ones containing the problem. This is an unacceptable probability compared to the tiny probability for error we allowed earlier, which is why in this example an exhaustive check is required. However, as we will soon see, SNARKs use sophisticated commitment schemes which can amplify the probability of error detection, allowing for this method of asking random questions to be highly effective, even with a small number of questions. The last building block of the SNARK is meant to eliminate the necessity for interaction. Recall that the N in SNARK stands for non-interactive, while the interactive oracle proof building block is inherently interactive. The Fiat Shamir transformation provides a way to make an interactive proof non-interactive. It does that by giving a way for Peggy to provide in her proof the answers to the questions Victor may ask so that she is not needed when he wants to ask them. Of course, there seems to be a problem here. If Peggy knows which questions she will be asked when making the commitment, she may be able to commit to an invalid solution, but one which appears valid for this particular choice of questions. To prevent this, we need some sort of random number generator, or RNG, that ensures Peggy answers only truly random questions. In short, we need a way to ensure that the RNG only generates numbers after Peggy has made her commitment. The Fiat Shamir transformation provides such a random number generator. For this purpose, it uses an object called the cryptographic hash function and feeds it the commitment as an input. The hash function is deterministic, meaning it would give the same output each time for a given input. But the output is indistinguishable from randomness, meaning there is no way to anticipate the output except by running the function. Feeding it two different inputs, even ones that are very similar to each other, would generate two completely different outputs. Instead of Victor asking random questions, Peggy makes her commitment and then runs the hash function to let it choose a random question for her, one that she couldn't anticipate before making the commitment. 
After adding the answer to that question to her proof, she can run the function again, this time with both the commitment and the first answer as inputs, so that the hash function chooses a new random question, and so on. The hash function is made to be practically irreversible, so there is no way for Peggy to first choose which questions she would like to answer, and then choose the commitment accordingly. When Victor receives Peggy's proof, he can trace her steps, running the hash function himself to make sure that Peggy indeed followed the protocol without cheating. The deterministic nature of the hash function would ensure that Victor knows which question it chose in every part of the proof. Now that we have seen to a high level how snarks are built, it becomes apparent just how much math goes into them. Arithmetization schemes, commitment schemes, probability, cryptography, hash functions, computational complexity, and more. And each of those contain many mathematical notions. We can't go in depth in a short video into all of these ideas. That would take an entire course. Instead, we chose to focus on a single mathematical idea that we hope can shed light on this entire concept of snarks, polynomial commitments. Polynomials have one powerful property which makes them useful for snarks, called the schwartz lemma. Simply put, it tells us that if we change even a single coefficient of a polynomial, its values will change almost everywhere. Take for example the fourth degree polynomial x minus 1 times x minus 2 times x minus 3 times x minus 4, which we can write in coefficient form in this way. We can look at its graph and see how it looks. Note that we chose it so that its value is 0 on the points x equals 1, 2, 3, and 4. What if we change one of its coefficients slightly? Say we look at this polynomial. We can see that it changed drastically. In particular, it no longer vanishes at x equals 1, 2, 3, and 4. At how many points can two different polynomials of degree d intersect? By equating two different polynomials of degree d, we can see that we get an equation of maximal degree d, which can have at most d solutions. So by choosing a finite set s of points on which we evaluate these polynomials, we can conclude that the likelihood for them to intersect at a certain point is bounded by the degree divided by the size of the set, d divided by size of s. In most snarks, polynomials are evaluated using modular arithmetic, which means using some kind of a clock with a large number of hours. By choosing a large enough clock, say numbers of 40 digits or around 128 bits, we can make this probability extremely small. If you are interested in learning more about modular arithmetic, there are quite a lot of good explanatory videos on the subjects with links in the description. One useful polynomial commitment scheme is called KZG after Aniket Kate, Gregory Zeverucha, and Ian Goldberg. The scheme they suggested works as follows. First, there is a setup phase. In the setup phase, a trusted third party, Thomas, chooses a secret random number which we call S. He then calculates the powers of S up to a certain number n and encrypts them, giving Peggy and Victor the result, the encrypted value of 1, which we call E of 1, E of S, E of S squared, all the way up to E of S to the power n. He then destroys the number S so that no one will ever know it. S here is used as a sort of a decryption key so knowing it will allow Peggy to send fake proofs. This is why this is called a trusted setup. We have to trust that nobody knows S, only the encrypted values of its powers. To make a commitment to a certain polynomial P of X with the coefficients P0, P1, P2, all the way up to Pn, Peggy sends the encrypted value of P of S. She does this using the value she got from Thomas. E of P of S equals P0 times E of 1 plus p1 times e of s, all the way up to pn times e of s to the power n. e of p of s is called the commitment to the polynomial p of x. Note that for this to be true, we need special operations, addition and multiplication, that act on encrypted values in the same way that regular addition and multiplication act on unencrypted values. That is, we need some special multiplication such that a times e of b equals to e of a times b, and also that e of a special plus e of b equals to e of a plus b. An encryption scheme with these properties is called additively homomorphic, and luckily many of the encryption schemes used today indeed are. Victor can now query Peggy for information about the polynomial. For example, he can choose a point z and ask Peggy to prove that it takes a certain value y equals p of z. He sends the number z as a question to Peggy. Peggy answers this question in the following way. She computes y equals p of z. 
she then computes a new polynomial q of x which is equal p of x minus y divided by x minus z known as the quotient polynomial. Note that this is still a polynomial even though it is written like a rational function. At the point x equals z, this looks like 0 divided by 0, but it takes a well-defined value. The reason is that z is a root of the polynomial p of x minus y, so we can factor out an x minus z term and divide by simply crossing it out. Peggy computes e of q of s, which is called the proof that y equals p. Supplied by y, z, the commitment e of p of s, and the proof e of q of s, Victor can now check that all these values match by checking that e of q of s times e of s minus y is equal e of p of s minus y times e of 1. Notice that here we have a new operation. The multiplication we defined before allowed us to multiply an encrypted value and an unencrypted value. The result was an encrypted value of the usual multiplication of two numbers. The new multiplication operation defined here defines a multiplication of two encrypted value. It doesn't require the result to be an encrypted value of anything though. It just requires the result to be some function of the product of the unencrypted values. In other words, we say that e of a special multiplication of e of b is some function of a times b. So that if a times b equals c times d, then e of a special multiplication e of b equals e of c special multiplication e of d. We also require that this function is non-degenerate, so that if a times b is not equal c times d, then e of a special multiplication e of b is not equal e of c special multiplication e of d. Fortunately for us, this type of operation exists in a particular encryption scheme called elliptic curve cryptography, where it is called a pairing function. We will not go into the math of elliptic curves and pairing functions here, maybe in the next video. Note that if Peggy doesn't know the polynomial p of x and instead sends a fake commitment e of p of s, it will be nearly impossible for her to construct the polynomial q of x which will satisfy the above equation for some values of z and y. This is because there is no division for the special multiplication operation. If Peggy sent a commitment without knowing the polynomial and she wants to convince that this commitment matches a certain value z at a random point y, the schwartz zippel lemma tells us that the likelihood for her to hit a passing number is extremely small. What this commitment scheme gives us is a way to succinctly commit a lot of information, possibly very big polynomials, into a small number of encrypted values. It allows for small proofs which are fast to verify and are hard to fake or to extract information from. This is the heart of the ZK SNARKs and one of the main tools of zero-knowledge proofs. To conclude, let's sketch an outline of how Peggy can use a SNARK to prove to Victor that she knows a solution to a particular Sudoku problem. As a setup phase, Peggy and Victor ask a trusted friend to choose a secret number s and to use a certain elliptic curve cryptographic scheme to encrypt powers of s. The size of a Sudoku table is 81, so they would need 81 such powers. e1, es, all the way up to e to the s to the power 80. Of course, they don't need e to the s to the power 81 because e1 is just es of 0. They will also choose a cryptographic hash function for the Fiatchamir transformation. Next, Peggy constructs a proof. She takes her solution to the Sudoku and calculates an 80 degree polynomial for it in the following way. She takes each square in the Sudoku and uses it as an evaluation of the polynomial at some point, from x equals 0 all the way up to x equals 80. The coefficients of this polynomial can be calculated by solving a system of 81 linear equations of 81 variables. Peggy creates a commitment to this polynomial e of p of s using the setup data. Next, Peggy will prove that this solution matches the Sudoku problem they discussed. For that, she must prove the values of this polynomial at the starting locations. Say the Sudoku has the number 5 in the first row and second column. This is the location that matches x equals 1. Peggy will add to her proof the commitment of the quotient polynomial q1 of x equals p of x minus 5 divided by x minus 1. She does that for every starting location. Next, Peggy must prove that the solution obeys the rules of Sudoku. Say she wants to prove that the first row obeys the rules. She creates a polynomial for the first row in the following way. 
This is an 8 degree polynomial which matches the full solution polynomial at 9 points and due to the schwartz lemma is very unlikely to match it at any other point. Peggy can commit to this polynomial by setting e of r1 of s. Note that the difference p of x minus r1 of x is an 80 degree polynomial which has a value 0 on 9 points. Peggy can prove to Victor that they match by computing a generalization of the quotient polynomial qr1 of x equals px minus r1 of x divided by x minus 0 times x minus 1 all the way up to x minus 8. She adds its commitment eqr1 of s to her proof. She adds the proof eqr1 of s to her overall proof. Victor will be able to test this using a generalization of the KZG test we've shown before. For that, he would need to send Peggy a random number. Peggy uses their chosen hash function to simulate Victor's role and obtain the number without him, according to the rules of Fiat Shamir. To prove that R1 of X has all the numbers from 1 to 9, according to the rules of Sudoku, Peggy uses something called a lookup argument. This is a type of IOP that allows to prove that a certain list of numbers contains only numbers from a predefined list. Peggy repeats this process for each row, column, and block, adding all of the required proofs and commitments to her overall proof. When she is done, she sends the proof to Victor, who can now go over the proof element by element, and using the KZG testing method, test that the committed solution matches the Sudoku problem they discussed, and that each of its rows, columns, and blocks obey the rules of a valid Sudoku solution, convincing him that Peggy indeed knows the solution. In fact, there is also a way to aggregate all of those checks into a single check, making this proof truly succinct. As you can see, there is a lot more to learn about this subject. We hoped we have sparked your interest and showed you the complexity and power of zero-knowledge proofs. At Ingonyama, we strive to provide comprehensive insights and education in the ever-evolving world of cryptography. Whether you're a curious beginner or a seasoned professional, our resources are tailored to meet your needs. Check out the description for more links and info, and don't forget to subscribe and share if you found this video helpful.